episode of the Shabbat Show. Shabbat Shalom. Please welcome us to Shabbat Shalom back. Tell us where you're watching from. We love connecting with you like this each and every single week. Now, last week's show was such a super duper hit and we got a lot of questions about this recipe. So we're going to go ahead and roll tape, show you the recipe in case you missed it, and then I'm going to answer your questions. Yum. I wish I had that ready now. <laughs> I so, so want to eat that. Now, the number one question you guys were asking was how to turn this into a vegetarian or technically it could be a vegan dish. Very simple. Just omit the ground beef and replace it instead with either cooked lentils for protein and or chopped mushrooms. Mushrooms will give it that meaty umami flavor and I think it's going to be absolutely delicious. Now, if you're having a little trouble fitting back into your clothes, I'm talking to myself, okay? Just like me. <laughs> Maybe you wanna swap out the white rice for either brown rice or even quinoa, which has like a lot of protein. It's a nice super grain. So enjoy this. I hope that you go ahead and make it now, whether you love meat or you're a vegetarian or you're a vegan. And now stay tuned for the most amazing Shabbat show. And don't worry, I'm going to be back at the end of the show. So keep watching till the very end with an amazing seasonal challah recipe. Stay tuned. And hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Shabbat Show. Oh, so great to be back with you again another week. I feel like it's like a whole new world. Do you feel that way? Like, if you come post-holidays, you're feeling that that whole world is like, we're like in a new space. For those of you around in the Northeast this week, we finished out the Sukkot holiday. It was like 68 degrees on Sunday. And then Monday, the day afterwards, was like cold and rainy. It was like the beginning of a new chapter. And now we're back into our world. You know, there's a great line from a great rabbi named Rabbi Dessler who said that you're not really supposed to go through the holidays. The holidays are supposed to go through you. And the whole goal of these holidays, the whole goal of having a season of holidays is not that we can just take a break from our lives, eat a whole lot more, take more time off from work, see our families more, introspect, pray, whatever, whatever, whatever. That's not really it. All of that stuff really is so that when we come out of these holidays, regardless of the level of observance, regardless if you observed one or all, when we come out of these holidays, we have to be a little bit different. We have to be different people. And one of the ways that we're different is we get closer to the ideal. What is this ideal? God is driving us towards somewhere. There's a, there's a purpose. 
And one of the things that God keeps on telling us is I put you in this earth because I want you to have the ideal. I want you to have it all. He wants us to not only be physically in this earth, he wants us to be spiritual beings, to live in both worlds, to have our feet nested and planted in this ground, but to have our eyes and our hearts in, in a much greater place, to balance physical and spiritual, to be able to go deeper when we need to, and to live a physical life. We were placed here. Many of the commandments and the mitzvot that we did in the past few weeks and months were physical things. But at the same time, to strive in our own ways, at our own levels, for more spirituality, for a deeper existence, for a deeper meaning in everything that we do, in our families, in our careers, in our days, our weeks, and our years. And when you take a break and you introspect the level that the holidays bring, the real goal is that break that immersion brings us back to now. Now, this is life. Life is post-holidays. Life is mid-October. When, when we're here now, we're supposed to take something with us. Be bigger, be stronger, be better, be deeper. And this is the balance of our lives. Increasing spirituality looking at the world, not for what it is, but for the deeper purpose of why I do what I do. And a lot of this show is about that because this is the show that's going to take us, if you will, and begin the process throughout uh, the entire season. And one of the things we're going to speak about today is the whole concept of Shabbat itself. It's a Shabbat show, but really balancing Shabbat with life is the question. How do we do that? How do you give up a seventh of your work life? What is that? How do you balance that intensity of spirituality with your life? But it's more than just Shabbat. It's this whole concept of doing things right. It's about looking at the world in a very specific way. Check out this video from Jerry Seinfeld. It's always good to start with Jerry. About just how to balance what we do and what we have with what makes us happy. Check this out. <laughs> advertising because I love lying. <laughs> In advertising, everything is the way you wish it was. I don't care that it won't be like that when I actually get the product being advertised because in between seeing the commercial and owning the thing, I'm happy. <laughs> and that's all I want. Tell me how great the thing is going to be. I love it. I don't need to be happy all the time. I just want to enjoy the commercial. I want to get the thing. We know the product is going to stink. We know that. Because we live in the world and we know that everything stinks. We all believe, hey, maybe this one won't stink. We are a hopeful species. Stupid, but hopeful. But we're happy in that moment between the commercial and the purchase. And I think spending your life trying to dupe innocent people out of hard-won earnings to buy useless, low-quality, misrepresented items and services is an excellent use of your energy. Because a brief moment of happiness is pretty good. I also think that just focusing on making money and buying stupid things is a good way of life. I believe materialism gets a bad rap. It's not about the amount of money. Nothing's better than a Bic pen, a, a VW Beetle, or a pair of regular Levi's. If your things don't make you happy, you're not getting the right things. This will all be in my new book, Soulful Materialism, which is in the planning stages at this moment. Isn't that true? Isn't that totally true? It's the stuff that we chase that we think makes us happy. It doesn't make us happy. We're going to talk about this today. We've got a great show coming up for you. Stick with us to the end. 
Uh, it's got so much happening here. For those who are not with us that you think should be with us, just send them the link to the Shabbat show.com, get them going on the show. We've got Jesse and Michelle Revivo from Toronto on the show. We've got Bruce Leon from Chicago on the show. We've got a great partner and friend, Project Inspire, the real estate and hotel mogul, Alan Isaac Gross on the show. We got videos and inspiration. And of course, we've got uh, Jamie Geller on the show come back later on. Uh, please, if you can, if you're able to via Facebook or on Zoom, send us uh, a shout out where we'd love to sort of give Shabbat Shalom's again to those that are coming in. I want to just do a few right now while we get going. Of course, the Begun and Bolton family, Shabbat Shalom. Ozzy from Baltimore, Shabbat Shalom. Um, to, of course, very importantly, to a wonderful person who is right now that is in the need of our prayers. Her name is Aviva Bas Shenachana. She's actually the niece of Rav Noah Weinberg. Uh, please have her in mind for the tefillos and Shabbat Shalom, of course, to that family, to Jody and Toby Burkow, Shabbat Shalom to you guys. Um, and to everyone else, please feel free to tap in. We'd love to see you again. Um, of course, we're going to talk MindFlex. That's coming up this week. Check out uh, the, what, what's happening this week. Uh, last two weeks ago, we actually had Rabbi Hanan Anthony Gordon on here on the show, and he shared his wisdom He'll be speaking about spiritual time management. For those that are interested, please check that out. It's October 20 and 21, 9 p.m. Uh, of course, we've got the one-on-ones. Thank God there's been an uptick. Continue coming. New year, new opportunity to keep on growing one-on-ones. If you want a specialized person, this is custom learning here. That's how we like it in this world. Bespoke learning. 97,000. Text one-on-one to 97,000. Or just go to projectinspire.com and You'll find a way to connect there. Um, and of course, you can check this out and the longer interviews as well um, that'll take place in the show um, at the Shabbat show.com. Okay, let's begin. Uh, we're going to start with an incredible guest, Jesse and Michelle Revivo of the Spudnik uh, Snack Company. These are, they are owners and operators of the snack food manufacturing company called Star Brand Production. Their brand is Spudnik's. They manufacture a large variety of kettle chips and popcorn. Michelle also owns a women's entrepreneurial platform called TWP, the Women's Plat Panel, that brings entrepreneurial women together each month with, with incredible panelists. Uh, there we go. Hi, Charlie. Hello, hello. welcome to hello. the show. How are we doing, Mr. Harari? Thank you for having us. Oh, my God, it's so good that you're here. For full disclosure, I love them very much. We've had Shabbat meals together up in Toronto in Harari North, the Bloom family. And what? Jesse and I were brothers on the trip in Israel. So right. it's great to see you guys and have you on. Talk to us a little bit before we jump into the spirituality part. Give us a little bit about how you got into this business. Like, how did you get into the snack business? Oh. It's a crazy story, actually. Uh, well, 15 years ago, I'll tell a little bit and then I'll hand it over to Jesse. 15 years ago. Um, we got involved with the event business. I was an esthetician by profession and uh, we somehow got involved with the event business. We started a company called, called Party Props and we started doing bar and bat mitzvahs and kettle chips are my favorite snack food. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to create a way to entertain guests on location. So we created a chip theater. We started manufacturing our own uh, potato chips, classic chips with a, a barbecue size Fryer, and we create a chip theater where we would season and serve warm kettle uh, potato chip on location, and that kind of stemmed to building up retail locations in malls. And wow! Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. I just I, I love those stories of individuals making things happen. You know, from their ideas into life. Now, along the way, from what I understand, is that you've also changed the the way you interacted from a spiritual perspective as well, right? Whether it's with Shabbat or other things, take us through that a little bit. But how you started, where you are, and and a little bit of that journey. I don't think I ever told you the story, Charlie, but it's a really a spectacular story. Um, it goes back to when we started becoming Bale Chuba, when we started becoming practicing Jews, 13, 14 years ago, probably. We've always been entrepreneurial. We've always owned businesses. Um, that's what keeps our blood pumping. It, 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 it keeps us, wakes us up in the morning. Um, and so um, 13 or 14 years ago was no exception. We had multiple businesses. We brought together a snack food concept where we had potato chips on one side and ice cream on the other side of this retail kiosk. And we put them out in all these malls across um, Ontario and across Canada. 
Uh, now you guys are a lot of people are familiar with a franchise model. We kept this corporate, which means Michelle and I owned all these stores, which means we serviced all these stores. And we had co-packers making chips for us. We had co-packers supplying us with product. So we didn't worry about the back end. We just wanted to sell the product. Right. So we had all this retail. And as you can imagine, knowing full well, retail operates primarily on the weekends where people go shopping, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> so you're asking, can business and Shabbat coexist? And if you asked us 14 years ago, absolutely not. How could I keep Shabbat? I, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm out delivering product. I'm dealing with staff. I'm, that's where I'm making my money. My right. money on Monday to Thursday, nothing. Right. So um, we decided, you were mentioning earlier the, the, some of the tribulations. We decided, and I remember it vividly, coming into the family room. We were just getting started. We weren't really, you know, kind of dabbling in mitzvahs here and there. Definitely not Shomer Shabbat, definitely not people who are trying to do mitzvahs, but once in a while, just being a little bit more aware, listening to some lectures of our rabbi online. And then one day I came to Michelle <laughs> I and I that. said, Mish, I think it's time to keep Shabbat. And she looked at me and said, <laughs> okay, so what does that mean? What do we do? Yeah, what How do we keep Shabbat? <laughs> and I yeah. said, you know what? I don't know. <laughs> I love well, this. <laughs> but let's start with the lights. Right? We know we're not supposed to turn off the lights. The lights are off limit. Everything else is good, but baby steps, we'll do the light thing and then we'll see where it goes. So long story short, the le the next probably 2 or 3 months of our lives crazy was a roller coaster. Crazy. It was absolute mayhem. Everything around us was seemingly falling apart. Our business partnerships, we were in two of them at the time. Both of them came to an end, not of our doing, but our partners doing. We got phone calls from each partner for different reasons, very serious meetings, um, and both partnerships dissolved. We were beside ourselves. We, we, were, didn't, we, we didn't know what to think. Like puppets. We were like puppets in a show. As if like Hashem was running the show, we were just puppets. We got a phone call. We had a store in one mall. We've been trying to sell it for probably over a year or two. Yeah. And no bites. Suddenly we get a phone call. Somebody wants to buy the store. No questions asked, full asking price. Unbelievable. Suddenly I get a phone call from a land, another landlord who says, guys, I need you to spend tens of thousands of dollars if you want to keep that store. It's a marginal store. They weren't willing to give us anything in return. We had to make a choice. We found ourselves over the course of the next few months, shutting down certain stores, selling, selling off. off other stores, getting out of relationships, business partnerships. Our whole world was unraveling in front of us. It was terrifying to say the least. The moment we decided to keep Shabbat. Like we, we had often opportunities where we, where we went for a coffee, we pulled ourselves out of the situation, we blocked out all the noise, and we just reflected on what was going on. And we, we somehow brought it back to literally the day, the Shabbat, that wow. I said to Michelle, insane. we're turning, we're not touching the lights. Wow. Okay. So fast really forward, unbelievable. and now we're in a position just a few months after where all of the retail has been handed off. Yeah. And now we're in the business of supplying all of the retail that exists. So slowly but surely from that point, probably over a matter of a year or two, we ended up going into the background. We ended up saying, you know what? We don't need to rely on manufacturers anymore. Let's get into the manufacturing business. Let's start supplying all these kiosks and these retail stores that we've opened up. And so, um, that's what we did. And now mm -hmm. today, thank God, we find ourselves um, running a Baruch Hashem, a, a very large facility where we, uh, manufacture. we manufacture uh, snack food. There we go. I hear it. I hear it cringling. Let's see it. I hear it cringling. Beautiful. Sorry, shameless plug. <laughs> I love it. This is, our new this is our new packaging. Let's see it. <laughs> Incredible. Well, we kind of went retro. We I love it. So let me ask you one question before we have to go. Give us in, in, in a couple of words, give us um, what, it, what it means to you now. Give us how it feels that this is now, you, you've made, you did something huge. You did something that's, that's massive. You've took a step for spirituality without the, the, the catch underneath, without the net. 
What does it feel like now that you have this as part of your life? Well, personally, I'll tell you, Charlie, and everyone else, like at the beginning of this whole experience, it was very nerve wracking for me. And I'll, I'll tell you, honestly, after having, thank God, three children, Shabbat and keep and being observant means the world to, to us, to me, especially. I, I couldn't ask for anything more, honestly. Wow. Yeah. So from my perspective, it's, it's uh, and I tell this to a lot of people, before Shabbat, we couldn't imagine keeping Shabbat. Before Shabbat, right. it was so difficult to turn off our phones. It was so difficult to shut down our computers. It was so difficult to disconnect from the world. But now, there isn't an amount of money yeah. in the world Beautiful. that you can offer us to turn on our phones, to Incredible. turn off technology. It just doesn't equate. It's not an right. option. Guys, thank you so much for being on the show. You're, I'm like, I got chills. I, I'm loving the story. I got my, but just so you know, I got my story for the Shabbat table now. Just letting you know that, you know, we'll be passing on. We'll send you, we'll send you products, okay? Send me products, exactly. We'll tell it over. But thank you so much for being on. Thanks for who you are, what you do, and what you stand for. And, and really, when, when, when I hear it from you, it makes it more special for me. So thanks so much for what you've done and, and shining your light on this world. Thanks for having us. Thank we love you for seeing having you, Charlie. Us. Awesome. Good to see you guys. And thank you so much. And, and that's exactly, this is what we're talking about. This idea of having it all really to step into one direction and to take a physical life and not give it up, but to only increase this concept of spirituality. There's a line that I will not forget that just came out of this interview where before Shabbat, they couldn't imagine keeping Shabbat. And once they keep Shabbat, they couldn't imagine not all the money in the world. And that's what we were talking about. And really this is beyond Shabbat. It's doing the right thing. It's living a certain life. There's a great story that, that we saw this week that I want to share about a rabbi in a plant that just lived a certain way that manifested and ended up really making a difference in his life. Check this out. There's a kosher meat factory in Argentina comprised of several buildings. The entire complex is surrounded by a tall chain link fence and everyone enters through an iron gate in the front. The owner, Kamen Rokeach, is a very hard worker. He's the first one in every morning and the last one out every evening. Domingo, the guard at the front gate, knows that when Kamen leaves in the evening, he can lock the gate and go home. One evening in November 2007, Kamen was leaving. Good night, Domingo, he called out to the guard. You can lock up now. No, Domingo said. Not everyone has left. What are you talking about, Kamen asked. Everyone went home two hours ago. Not true, Domingo replied. Rabbi Berkowitz is still inside. Maybe you just didn't see him leave, Kalman said. Believe me, I am positive he is still inside, Domingo insisted. We better go look for him. Kalman knew that Domingo was reliable and took his words seriously. He jumped out of his car and they both rushed back to the compound. He searched the large main factory room, but Rabbi Berkowitz wasn't there. They ran into the office building, but he wasn't there either. They searched the truck dock and the packing house, going from room to room. Finally, they came to the huge walk-in refrigeration room where the meat was stored and kept frozen. They opened the door, and to their shock and horror, they saw Rabbi Berkowitz on the floor, coughing and shivering, trying desperately to breathe. He had been locked inside. They ran over to him, lifted him off the floor, and helped him out of the refrigerated room, past the thick, heavy door that had been locked behind him. They wrapped blankets around him and made sure he was warm and comfortable. Kamen Rokeach was shocked. Domingo, he asked, how did you know that Rabbi Berkowitz was still inside? There are over 300 workers here every day. Domingo said, every morning when that rabbi comes in, he greets me and says hello. He asks how my morning is going and wishes me a wonderful day. He shows me respect and makes me feel important. And every single night when he leaves, he says, thank you so much. Have a pleasant evening. He never misses a night and I wait for his kind words. Hundreds of workers pass me every day, morning and night, and they don't say a word to me. They show me no respect or recognition. Rabbi Berkowitz does. I knew he came in this morning and I was sure he hadn't left yet because I was waiting for his friendly goodbye for the evening. One of the most important things we can give a person is honor and respect. When you show a person that you care about their well-being, you infuse them with life. Rabbi Berkowitz appreciated the value of every person, and because he validated life, he merited life. Rabbi Berkowitz's life was saved because of his genuine care and concern for another human being. 
Every human being is made in the image of God and has infinite value. Chaviv Adam Shenivra B'Tselem. How precious and dear is every person, the Mishnah tells us, because he is created in God's image. The greatest gift we can give others doesn't cost us a penny. It's the gift of love and recognition, showing others we respect and value them. Incredible concept. And it's really true. Um, it's spirituality is not just in one area, but it's how you live, how you talk, how you value every human being. The next guest that we have is someone that's very important to me personally and to this whole organization. Um, Mr. Alan Isaac Gross is a, has been and is a partner of Project Inspire in so many levels. He's the chairman and CEO of GFI Capital Resources Group, and he brings over 40 years of real estate experience to the company. GFI's property management portfolio currently manages close to 16,000 residential apartments units across the country. Among his many accomplishments, it includes the development of the Ace Hotel in New York, an internationally praised and award-winning boutique hotel. Mr. Gross's recent strategic development of the Beekman Hotel and residences in downtown Manhattan has changed the environment over there. The Beekman has received multiple awards, including Travel and Leisure Magazine's Best Hotels in New York State and TripAdvisor's Best Five Star Hotels in New York City 2017. Mr. Gross is not only an established entrepreneur, but also serves his community by guest lecturing at universities, real estate symposiums, and various other organizations. And I can tell you personally, from having the honor of knowing him for as long as I do, he is one of the most dedicated people to the Jewish community and to the Jewish people. He was very close with Aish, Aish Hattorah's founder of Noah Weinberg, and in many ways carries his legacy with everything he does. I had a chance to catch up with him literally this week and talk about him and his ability to build this incredible business while maintaining a commitment to spirituality. Check out this interview. So Isaac, thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's an honor to have you. It's my pleasure, Charlie. Being with you anywhere is a pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Talking to you anytime is a great pleasure. I feel the same way. Thank you. And in honor. <laughs> thank you. And, you know, many times when you speak to people that are uh, observant, that have kept Shabbat, uh, it's, it's a challenge for people and, and it's an opportunity for people. And, uh, and people speak about what it means to them. But, but sometimes you meet somebody who really started their career a little earlier than the current time. You know, you started in the 1970s and you built a business, a real estate company that has to navigate the modern world and compete and grow in the modern world where sometimes you have to be available at all times to get the deal or to close the transaction. So from your perspective, as a founder of a large real estate company, as a builder of something, how has Shabbat played a role in your career? Has it helped you? Has it hurt you? What is your, what is your perspective on someone who has along the way always balanced both words, both worlds? I think by people knowing that uh, I'm Shoma Shabbat, I'm observant, uh, gives them a distinct feeling that I'm very disciplined because they know I don't compromise. Uh, it's funny because you know a lot of the things that I do involves personalities and involves chefs and involves restaurants and hoteliers and different uh, very prominent people. And um, everybody knows I don't compromise. There's nothing that moves my Shabbat. And, you know, the word around my office, for instance, is, uh, Mr. Gross, what time do you go into your cocoon? <laughs> uh, we want to know exactly how long we got with you. And um, it's not a negotiable item. I don't care if I'm with a banker. I don't care if I'm with a politician or with a, with a star or anything like that. They know that the time comes, I'm out of there. And how, how along the way... Um, has that evolved? Were you, when you started, were you like that? Were you um, able to make those decisions or at least share in the same way that you could later on as you grew in your career? Well, you know, I started in a law firm and in the early seven, mid-70s, I should say, it was very difficult. You didn't find 
a lot of guys walking around with a yarmulke. It was non-existent. In fact, uh, most people that were looking for jobs at that time had a difficult time because uh, the interviewer um, would make it a point, you know, somehow to fish if uh, he can count on you on Saturdays for hours or not. I think the most important message was whether I'm gone or not, or here or not there, I will always make up my time and I was always respect your time. It's not going to be used as an, uh, an avenue of me to get out of work. Right. So uh, at the beginning, I did not uh, publicize the fact that I'm Shoma Shabbos and, and I'm uh, observant. And over time, as people got to know me, I got more and more comfortable uh, with not only can I use this as an opportunity to show them who I am, but an opportunity to really get people warmed up that what it really means. It really means what kind of life I leave and make them more comfortable with who they are dealing with. Um, I'm predictable, I'm disciplined. Um, I think the, I, I answer to a higher, you, uh, uh, higher being. I uh, am respectful. I try to do the things that are right because that's the life I lead. And it's very funny because one of my best friends is a Roman Catholic. And everybody looks at us, you know, when we're at a meeting together, <laughs> which one of us is more religious? <laughs> And, and it's very funny because he is very disciplined. You know, he's a guy that uh, studies every night psalms and he'll call me up and ask me to interpret a, a passage. Why, what, when, where. And it's, very, it, it's, it's a fascinating life to lead when they know who you are and what they can count on and what they're going to get. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that, that you say that, and I think it's a, a misconception that people have. Uh, we live in a modern world that, that in many ways, especially in the business world, is seen to be sort of sanitized from faith. Whereas like you not, you know, you just leave it, leave it at the doorstep and, and you, you come in without. And I think when you are of faith or you are a, a person that is willing to lead with faith and to make sacrifices for faith, over the course of time, those people don't lose. In fact, what they may lose in a, lose in a few hours, they gain back in a, a level of respect and understanding and dependability. Did, did you ever have moments where it, you were pushed to the brink? Did you ever have a moment where, you know, you, it was a Friday afternoon and you were like, I, I, I can't, but, and did you ever have those moments where on the way out, going home for Shabbat, you were like, I, I'm going to lose the whole thing and I got to go? Charlie, I've had many, many times um, that, you know, I had a terrible Shabbos because I walked out of a meeting or walked out of a closing and I told them I am going to walk out and they didn't believe me because <laughs> it was a time of the essence deal. Oh my and God. I, and I walked out and I really walked out knowing I blew this and not only my money, but a lot of money was at risk and I had no choice and I had to leave. And uh, I was thinking to myself, maybe I shouldn't leave. I should stay and I'll walk home. I mean, I was thinking all crying crazy things. And I said, you know what, God, I'm in your hands. Whatever you want to happen will happen. And it's for my good. And I left. And it's interesting, the minute Shabbos was over, my phone rang and it was the other, the, the, um, the lawyer from the other side who happened to be a non-observant Jew and, he, and his client was not Jewish and he just called to tell me, I want you to know, don't worry, we'll continue it on Monday. Wow. And my client was very, very impressed that you, that you left regardless of what the consequences were. And that was just a brief uh, bit of that interview. I, I can tell you that if you go to the shabbatshow.com, I would believe maybe tomorrow or early next week, you must watch the entire interview. Uh, in that interview, Isaac tells over an incredible story about when he went down to Washington with the head of a bank and how it all evolved. It, it was awesome. And you don't want to miss it. 
So check it out on the Shabbat show.com. Just it's worth seeing his whole interview just to get that story. It's really one for the ages. Uh, now it's time for one of our favorite times of the show. Of course, what would we do without Kahoot? I think one time we can roll Kahoot now. I think, I think one time we missed it and people are like texting, like, what's up? This is when we compete uh, with our friends, family, and each other. Kahoot, either get it on your computer, the app, just go to it. Um, 661 This is the time of the week that I make sure my mom is on, which is my job as her son, which I take uh, pride in. 661-4028. Mommy, I hope that you got this. Everybody else, feel free to jump in right away. While we do that and get everybody a chance to go on, I want to wish a couple of Shabbat Shalom to the Novak family from Toronto, the Silvers in Highland Park. Shabbat Shalom to the Pomeranz kids from Baltimore. Hello, hello, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in in regards to your family. Uh, the Bendrigi family of, from New York, Miami, I hope I pronounced that right. If not, please send me the phonetic spelling so I can get it right in the future. Stacy and Al Levenrad from Maryland. Uh, Shabbat Shalom and thank you. Patriots Rock is on. Uh, remember, you can get on to Kahoot through Kahoot.it. That'll get you on. Uh, so you can get on now and sign in 661-4028. Um, to uh, Dorit Shabbat Shalom, to Henya from Toronto Shabbat Shalom, to Lily from Montreal, Quebec Shabbat Shalom to you, to John from Oxfordshire, England Shabbat Shalom, thank you so much, Miriam Sittner, we I got Kahoot Shabbat Shalom to you, um, to uh, Al Fishman Shabbat Shalom, Orna Suruya Shabbat Shalom. To all the Toronto fans, I feel like there's so much Toronto love coming in for the Revivos. They deserve it. They were phenomenal. Shabbat shalom, everybody here. One or two more minutes. We got Elon Corlum just popped in, I saw. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the show, Elon. To Bob Perlmutter, Shabbat shalom, Lincolnwood, Illinois. Okay, let's go to the first question. Let's begin. Here we go. First question. How do you say business in Hebrew? Revach, Hefsed, Esek, or Shakran? You, knowing Hebrew is, is, a, is a value added to know it, to being part of this show. Revach, Hefsed, Esek, or Shakran. Shabbat Shalom um, to Daryl Gear from South Africa. To Orna, thank you so much. Shabbat Shalom to you. Okay, here it goes. The first answer is. Essek, very good, very good. Essek, let's see how we did today. Joel K on the board, Hillary, Mervis, Srilly, and RM. RM, I think RM is a constant. Let's go to the next question. Looking forward to seeing what, how we do over here. In the startup business world, a unicorn is an unrealistic idea that is destined for failure. A privately held startup company valued at over a billion a business proposal that gets 100% funding from an investor or using your home as collateral for business expenses. What is a unicorn? Shabbat Shalom to Michael Weingrad. Judy Hersfeld, Shabbat Shalom to you and thank you for all that you do. Anad Ishai to Jenny Kravitz, Shabbat Shalom. To Dorian Hausman from Boston, Shabbat Shalom to you. Here goes. The second answer is a privately held startup company at a billion dollars. That's what a unicorn is so rare as a unicorn is. Here we go. Let's see how we did. Joel K continues to dominate. Mervis, AJH, Gibbs is back. And Sobel. Okay, let's go to the next question. Please feel free to tap into any of our Shabbat Shaloms. Here goes. Number three. Israel is the blank in world population. 25th, 50th, 75th, or the 100th. You see the breadth? Of these questions? I mean, come on. What other show goes from Hebrew words to business terms to Israeli population studies? I mean, only here. 25th, 50th, 75th, and 100th. Which one? How many people are in Israel compared to the rest of the world? Here we go. 100th. A hundredth. This was an interesting response. A lot of people thought we were 50th. We have very little people in Israel compared. Let's see how we did on the scoreboard. 
Joel K continues on. Little Dave steps up. We got the Novaks from Toronto climbing and the Mervis family. Okay, let's go to the fourth and final question for this week's Kahoot game. Israel ranks number 13 in the world index of startup companies with approximately how many companies? How many startup companies you think Israel is producing? 241, 368, 613, or 890? Just think about this number for a second. They're 13th in the world of startup companies. That's not per capita. That's actual straight numbers. It's incredible. 241, 368, 613, or 890. How many companies is Israel producing? Startup companies. Here it goes. The answer is 890. Oh, good. A lot of guys, a lot of people got this. Think about that number for a second. Wow. Go Israel. Here we go. Let's see how we did. Third place. The Silver family continues to be part of this board. Second place, AJH. And the first place winner is the Novak family in Toronto. They just rolled in and took the cake. Congratulations. Lots of Toronto love here on the show. Thank you so much for joining us and being a part of it. And of course, it's time right now for the one and only Jamie Geller. Check out this week's video. Charlie, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. I told you I would be back. In case you missed that first segment, guys, please be sure to tune in on time every single week because this is the most amazing streaming Shabbat show ever. There, I just said it. Okay, this week we are making pumpkin challah. It is officially fall. It is officially pumpkin season. And challah is the official food of Shabbat. So we are marrying these two amazing favorites, pumpkin and challah, into this special recipe. Make sure you always say, hey, tell us where you're watching from and ask us any questions. We're here to answer them each and every week. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Jamie, as always. Usually when we get to watch Jamie in the beginning, for those who were with us in the beginning, we used to have the show on Friday afternoon. So when all her delicious looking food comes out, I'm like, that's cool. I got like two hours and I'm going to pound. Now I got to wait another day. Jamie, God bless you. Continue doing what you're doing for more great videos from Jamie. Please go to jamiegeller.com, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, at Jamie Geller or at Julish by Jamie. And if her mom is watching, a shout out to you and Nachas. Our next guest is an incredible individual. His name is Bruce Leon. He is the owner and founder of four sister companies in the Chicago area, the Tandem Family of Companies. This, this group of companies has been recognized from some of the greatest publications, from Cranes to Chicago's Live, just privately held companies to Inc. 5000. He was Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year finalist two years in a row. He's the Chicago area's Entrepreneurial Hall of Fame inductee. And when not expanding his business or starting new businesses, he enjoys spending time with his family, especially his young grandsons, who he's grooming to be lifelong Cub fans. He currently serves as a board member on many philanthropic boards and different organizations and a mentor to many young professionals. And it is an honor to have Bruce on the show. Uh, Bruce, welcome to the show. 
Hey, Charlie, how are you? I'm wonderful. Uh, we don't see you yet. Okay, hang on a second. How are we doing now? Awesome, we, we got you. Perfect. All right. Bruce, thank you so much for making thank the time. You. I know you're so busy for being part of the show this week. It's great to have you on. Thank you, Charlie. It's really an honor to be uh, with you. You know, I, I listen to your daily boost on my commute to work. I uh, hope I got some zeal this morning. <laughs> and I got my coffee right here, as you there tell you everybody, me, right? I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, people tell me that you're the Jewish uh, Tony Robbins. I don't believe it. He might be the non-Jewish Charlie Arreri, as I far as I'm concerned, that. okay? But uh, it's you. really a great honor. And I do want to plug that you're going to be on a Zoom uh, in Chicago event on December 7th. We're always grateful when you come back to your wife's roots in Chicago. And That's right. uh, the Ember Foundation is going to have it, and they, people can get more more Charlie on December 7th. So good luck. Thank you. I appreciate that. And it is always going back to my to my family's roots in Chicago. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about this the tandem family of companies. Give us a little bit about what it is that these companies are so we can appreciate more uh, the, 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 the companies that you've built. So tandem is really uh, what we do is we're a PEO. A PEO, we do the back office administration, HR, employee benefits uh, for about 400 companies, mostly small, mid-sized companies that don't have the ability to uh, have sort of the HR department that a big hospital might have or a big Fortune 500 company. Um, it's become very popular in the last uh, 10 years. We've been doing it for 23 years. So, uh, you know, it's quite thrilling for me because I get to work with all these different entrepreneurs, all these different companies. I've got one company that makes the fillings for all the Krispy Kreme and the Dunkin' Donuts uh, treats. I got another company that uh, makes a wonderful uh, liquor, uh, actually has the Bob Dylan brand um, and every story. And I love to hear a fourth generation business. Um, I've got one company that has a hundred family members working inside the company. Can you believe that? Wow. wow. Um, and, and they uh, get along? An amazing company and uh, they're a worldwide steel company. And uh, it's fascinating. So I have, a, I have a great job. I get to uh, do a lot of the stuff that they don't want to do the payroll, the uh, HR, the office administration, the benefit plans, 401ks, and take it off so they can focus on their business. And I get to be with great entrepreneurs, which I love. Amazing. Now, as, as an observant Jew, you're running a diverse company. You built a company. How does your spirituality factor in? Shabbat, how you carry yourself. Where does spirituality uh, play into your career and how has it formed it or how have you lived in both of these worlds throughout yeah. your career? That's a great question. First of all, it's pretty hard to follow the revivals and the uh, and, and Mr. Gross's amazing stories. But, um, you know, when I started Tandem 23 years ago, I came out of the corporate world and I really wanted to, uh, I was a Balchuva and I had just uh, begun to, you know, uh, fully observant. And I decided if I had my company, you know, I was going to do things differently and, you um, uh, we closed the offices on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. It costs us uh, about $40,000 uh, a day to do that. It's a, just an extra holiday for my employees. Um, I was told by a lot of people, this is not a smart thing. People need their payrolls done. They're not gonna, they're gonna resent it. I've really never had a problem with that. Uh, my staff is about 120 people internally. I have about four or five Jewish people. So uh, everybody that gets on board in my company gets about a 30 minute a class in basic Judaism because we do have Jewish uh, customers. Um, I can tell you many of them know a lot about Shabbat now, about candle lighting time. You know, there's a joke in the office in the winter because payrolls get done on Friday. So there's some, sometimes I'm cutting a little bit too close. I have about a 25 minute commute and people will come in my office, Mr. Leon, Mr. Leon, sunset today is at 435. <laughs> it's one o'clock, you gotta leave, okay? Um, and, uh, and I've really never had a problem. You know, you go to Glassdoor and some of these awful sites where uh, people can vent their anger. And once in a while, if somebody's been fired or something, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, the company has these funny boxes on every door and the, and the owner uh, makes it a Jewish company. And, uh, but in general, for 98% of the time, my customers are respectful of it. I've got a public company in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, that comes full headgear um, into my office and uh, they, they uh, are very respectful. So, you know, I, I can only say that my success, I think, has been due because I've, I've brought that into the office 
And just like Mr. Gross said, it, it does give you a certain level of respect from your uh, customers that they know that you have values and you're going to bring that into the workplace. You know, it's interesting, you know, and I, and I, you know, everyone who's sort of gone through this sort of uh, understands that Shabbat can potentially be a, a financial liability and making the stand to, to be, to bring in that level of spirituality can create a financial challenge. What does it mean to you when you are running your company to have Shabbat? What does it do for you as a human being, knowing that you're running this company, you've got to be on six days a week, and then you sort of roll in to the end of the week? How does that impact your life? Well, first of all, I think that there's a common, you know, being in the HR world and being in the world of, uh, of uh, high performance executives and uh, that I think there's actually a trend now in the world that you know, they say even Bill Gates takes Wednesdays off without his technology. Uh, we all, we've all heard of the book that was written uh, by, uh, by the former Senator Lieberman um, about Shabbat. Uh, you know, it's actually a very healthy thing to recharge, to let the technology go. I encourage my employees to uh, take more time off. I explain to them about Shabbat and what it means. You know, a lot of them can't believe, well, if I text you, you know, if I, something urgent happens, uh, You'll, you'll be able to text me back. No, I don't. I shut it down. It's in today's world, people are kind of amazed, but I think it's a healthy way. I think we're, we have to be concerned about technology taking over uh, our lives. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's critical that, that people understand that we all need 25 hours of rest. You know, Charlie, I wanted to speak about one thing, which I think you'll get a kick out of. My, my company is a very diverse company. We have about 80% women. Uh, we're about 40% minority. We we have a lot of contracts where customers want to have HR people that speak uh, bilingual or nonprofits. And, uh, you know, we live in a world right now where diversity is very confrontational. And uh, there's a misconception out there that if everybody just, uh, you know, I, I hear this from young people sometimes. Well, I, I don't believe in Jew or Gentile. I don't believe in black or white or gay or straight. Everybody's one. That's not diversity. That's Stepford Wide world. We want to live in a world that is a stew, where people bring their authentic self and cultures into their environments, and they respect each other. And, and that's real diversity. And we've really pushed that. And we've been challenged in the last, uh, in the last couple of, of months, because it, it's not easy with these issues out there that are going out in, in the world today that cause a lot of uh, dissension. But I want to tell you a cute story, which I think you'll get a big kick out of. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the, the book, The Fred Factor. Sure. Uh, I, I, I'm, it, it's crazy you mentioned it because I pulled it off my shelf over the holidays. I just saw it. And over the past two days, I just went through it. Just this week, I read The Fred Factor. Again, I haven't read it since 2013. It's a I great book. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a part of YPO and, and uh, Vistage. And, and so we bring in these speakers like this every year. We big a big client of NIM, speak to my customers. So three years ago, Mark Sanborn came to my company. And just like you said, everybody here should get that book. It's a great book. It's about a postman named Fred, yeah. who uh, is just an amazing guy. This Mark Sandberg can't understand. This postman knows everybody's name. He knows their birthdays. He knows their dogs' names. He 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 knows their schedule, so he can he can hide their mail when they're away. And and he and he asks him, "What do you do this for? Because you're not only don't you make any more money, you're hated at the post office because the other postman can't can't believe you." And uh, and he really did a study on what people that bring passion to ordinary jobs. And uh, he's a great guy. And so he came to speak to our company. And while he was sitting there outside my office, I had a couple of performance issues going on. And you could see I was frustrated. He came in to me and he said to me, Bruce, I have to ask you a question. How much time do you spend on your C players, on your non, your lower performers? And I said, boy, 100% of the time. How much do you spend on your, on your great, you know, the people that are fantastic? I said, they don't need any, you know, I got a guy who's been doing payroll for 19 years. He drives across town on Friday afternoon. If somebody was late getting their pay, make sure they get their paychecks on time. Doesn't, doesn't, he just been fantastic. I, I don't need to spend a lot of time with them. He said, let me tell you about a study we did. He said, we found out that elementary school kids who were great, well-behaved and great students, by the time they got to seventh, eighth grade, they started hanging out with the clowns and the misbehaviors. And we found out when we asked them what was going on, they said, they get all the attention. We don't get any attention, okay? <laughs> and he made me a promise that every Friday I would walk around and recognize the high performers. 
So Thursday night, I'm sitting in my house, and you know what it's like. I have four daughters, and they're cooking up a storm, and that I'm, I'm putting my hands on all the food to taste, and they're chasing me out. And we make challahs. They're amazing challah bakers. And I said to them, I said, do me a favor. Make me four or five extra challahs. I don't want to give out kudos bars or Starbucks, you know, uh, gift cards. I want to, and I went around the next day, and I went to some high perform, and I all of them that had, you know, I'd gotten customers, and I put a note, you know, so-and-so called and said, you're amazing. And I gave them this challah. I didn't know how they'd react to it. Well, Charlie, we've been doing that for three years now. Wow. It's the most prized possession in my company. We've been featured in the, in the Tribune for this. Uh, people put up recipes. I've got African-Americans that swear that it's the best French toast thing, and they put their <laughs> pictures up. And, and I realized that they value that challah a lot more than they yeah. would a $10 Target gift card. Because yeah. it means something. They know it's a special bread for me, and they've all looked into the meaning of challah and so it means so much more. So we we love to bring that that Shabbat. Bring yourself to the office. Bring what's important. You don't worry about what people think because people will respect you by bringing that stuff into the office. And I think you know uh, we too, way too many people think that you know you're a Jew at home and on the street you you keep a low profile. I think people respect uh, you for for uh, for who you are and uh, and for being your authentic self. I completely agree. And, and Bruce, thanks so much for joining us on the show and continue being who you are, which is a, a, a Jew that lights up the world around you, both in your company and in the larger world. Thank you so much for joining us. Charlie, it's an to honor to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Bruce. And I, I love that story because it's exactly right. Um, that I love that. Story. I, I got such good stuff. I don't know if you got material because I got material from the show. That last story was so Everything was powerful that Bruce said, but I want to just sort of end with what he said at the end and then sort of wrap this up. Really is this idea that his authentic self was that hollow and he was sharing himself because he was proud of himself. You know, a lot of times in life, we're worried about what people think of us. We're worried that if I step into the spiritual world, what will happen to me? You saw by the Revivos what happened when they stepped into that world a little bit and the world started collapsing. Um, I think it was Michelle who said that she felt like she was a puppet right? That, that's such great imagery of, wait, what's going on? I'm part of something a little bit bigger. It's a little bit out of my hands. And Alan, who, Alan Isaac, who um, really walked away from a time of the essence closing because it violated his, his values, his principles, and only to find out that that, that led itself to, to greater respect. And now hearing it from Bruce and being able to really appreciate that diversity is not being the same. It's actually being different and appreciating the differences in ourselves and others. And really, this is what, what this is about. This is what greatness is about. Greatness is about pushing ourselves to be more, to be deeper, and not being worried about what someone else thinks or whether it's going to impact us in one way or the other. Because the deeper we go, the, the better our lives are. That's the challenge of Shabbat. You know, I have my own story. I've been keeping Shabbat, thank God, uh, for the majority of my life. And I, for a different show, I'll tell you my stories through all of my times of running out minutes before. And, but through all of that, one of the, mo the most inspiring moments that happened to me came from one of the participants on the men's trips that, I, that I'm honored to be a part of. It was a man who I saw in Florida. I can't, I didn't get permission, so I can't say his name. I, I saw him down in Florida and I was having dinner with a bunch of the guys. And he came over to me and he said, you know, I run this store. It's a, it's a, he's a chain of stores and he was with us in Israel and he met all these people that were unplugging. They were keeping Shabbat. They were unplugging. He said, that's not fair. I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the office on Saturday. Why? What? That's not right. Why do they get Shabbat? And I don't. Very similar to the Revo story. He said to me, I came home and told my wife that I want to try it. And she said, it's going to destroy our, our, our business. Saturday is the biggest day. And he goes, I'll do it for six months. And he jumped in and I was in Florida and he came over to me and he said to me, can I talk to you? I said, sure. He goes, I just got my accountant's report on the year. He said at the end of six months between this store and that store, this day, that day, he goes, I made the exact amount of money that I made when I had it open seven days a week. And, and he said it with such a, with, with like a twinkle in his eye. Like what, what is the spirituality thing? It's real. It's big. I'm not guaranteeing any economic moves, but all of us, at whatever level we're on, there's, there isn't like, do this, then do that. Wherever we all are, 
we deep down know the next step in our spirituality. Wherever we're holding, everybody, everybody has to stand and look out into this next phase of our lives. Everyone standing right after the holidays and staring at the year and looking at the winter. And winter's going to be over soon. And we're going to ask ourselves when we emerge from the hibernation, if you will, what did I, did I change? What did I put into my life? And all of us have the next level in front of us. And our job is to walk with boldness, to not be scared, to not be hesitant, to recognize that the more, the deeper I go, the better I am. And to feel the confidence of the creator of the universe saying, be deeper, don't worry. This world will cater to you. You don't cater to this world. That's what Shabbat stands for. Shabbat stands for the proof that this world really caters to us. When we do what's right, when we take time to go deeper, we get more than when we just stay at the surface. And my blessing to, to me, my blessing to you and to all of us is that we strive for more with zeal, with fearlessness, because we know that when we step into the to greater spirituality, we don't lose in the end. There's only, there's only one to gain. So on behalf of me and mine, to you and yours, I want to wish you a Shabbat Shalom. May this be a Shabbat of, of courage, of boldness, of fearlessness. A Shabbat where we have a minute to breathe and realize that the greatest thing I can do this winter time is to build myself and my family stronger. And with that, maybe, just maybe, next week, sometime soon, we get to do this show live from Jerusalem, the spiritual capital of the world. But until then, have an incredible weekend. Good Shabbos. Shabbat Shalom. With God's help, I cannot wait to see you again next week. Father,